Good evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's a great honor to be invited to give the 2019 Bartlett Lecture, in particular about democracy, human rights, and peace, which was created in memory of the Rev. Robert Bartlett and his wife. Personally, I see it, it's a hopeful and inspiring lecture as the purpose of the lectureship, which is highly needed these days to foster understanding of, and among other issues, if I want to replace democracy by freedom, human rights, and world peace. I am coming to share with you my story, not to have an academic lecture. I know many students, they are fed up with many academic lectures <laughs> because stories, they have a meaning. It's data, it's information we need to use. So I am coming dressed, another address, not the academic one, as a father, as an educator, as a physician, but most important, as a human. And in our life, we face challenges, difficulties, tragedies. But most important, we want to discover ways to be able to learn and find calmness inside ourselves for a better world. We need to challenge ourselves in order to work for a just human world, not to challenge each other, because there are serious challenges facing the world. But I believe there is no greater challenge than the lack of personal responsibility. Each of us is responsible. Taking personal responsibility transcends the circumstances and situations in which we find ourselves. One of the most important ingredients for moving forward is the knowledge of what we want exactly and to create a plan on how to achieve it, whatever the challenges and others say. We need to ask ourselves why I am here and where I am going and how and to have a sense of purpose and to ask ourselves, are we free in this world within ourselves and between us? My life as a Palestinian refugee child was a war. And in this world, people are fighting to live, and another group who are living to fight. But for me, as life increased my aches, my pain, and suffering, it also amplified my maturity, awareness, strength, and I didn't allow all the difficulties to kill my dreams and to prove myself. I found myself, as many others in this world, millions, hundreds of millions, in a life as a challenging, as a raging and wild ocean. But we need to ask, what is war? I learned as a physician what life and death actually mean when a person dies. I understand and realize the meaning of suffering and loss, the loss of loved ones, safety and security when we lose it. I understand and feel the suffering of all people who have lost loved ones, 
and they live in fear. The theme of my life has been building bridges with people and the branching into new beginnings. I saw the hope in the newborn baby I delivered. I was the first Palestinian doctor to practice medicine formally in an Israeli hospital because I believed in the message of health and health professionals. Medicine and education, they are the human equalizers, stabilizer, socializer, and harmonizer. When we treat patients or treat or deal with our students inside the class, we treat them equally, with respect, wishing them the success. Why not to practice these values outside the borders of academic institutions or hospitals? Because we are born free, we are born equal, and we have to live equal and free. As I said, the happiest moment when I handle the baby to his mother. No one on earth can differentiate between the cry of the newborn, Muslim, Jewish, Christian, Druze, black, white. Then we as a human being start to insert the differences and to deepen these differences. But at the same time, I saw the death of my daughters and my wife. I know the wound is painful, large, and deep, that I don't want anyone on earth to see what did I see. That these beautiful, lovely daughters, they became parts, drowning in their blood. One of the most difficult moments, it's not only the killing, Even to say farewell to them, I wasn't able to say farewell to them when they were buried. And even when someone is buried, you don't have a choice. You are not free where to be buried. We would love to be buried close to our loved ones. I wanted my daughters to be buried close to their mother. But at the same time, they were not able because of what we call the power, the military power, to dominate and to decide where to be buried. Bisan was 20 years old. Mayar was 15, Aya was 14. I wanted at least to see them. I can't recognize them. Mayar was decapitated. But at that moment, I am a Muslim with deep faith. I believe in God. I lost faith in the humanity. At that moment, as we see it these days, the world is watching what is happening everywhere in the world. And they don't extend hand or to speak out to stop or to give hand to relieve the suffering of the people in our world. So the only one who is hearing, who is alive, who is watching, who is close to us, I directed my face only and just only to God. He is the one who is everywhere to give hand. So during that time of the tragedy, I said, Oh God, oh Lord, to give me the strength, the patience to manage it. And God was close to support and to give hand. I know the wound is painful, large and deep, 
But I believe life has to continue. And as Einstein said, life is like riding a bicycle. To keep balanced, we must keep moving. I kept moving stronger, more determined not to give up, and not to forget or to look backwards. At the same moment of the tragedy, I started to think, what can I do to my daughter who was severely wounded, my niece, my brother, and what will be the future of my siblings, my living son, Muhammad, who was 12 years old. I looked at him. What a future is waiting for him. If he lost control and to be angry about our world, as we see it these days, to blame someone of being violent without asking, what did we do to make them violent? Because violence is the result of exposure. No one is born violent. But the message of support came from this 12 years old son. When he saw me screaming, crying, to say to me, why are you crying? Why are you screaming? You must be happy. Said me, maybe he doesn't know what is happening. How do you want me to be happy and be sad? My Aya and Nur are killed. He said, I know. I know my sisters and niece are killed. But I know that they are happy there. They are with their mom who died four months before, and she asked for them. That's the Palestinian in whom I see every a child in this world. So we need to focus on them and to learn from them and to provide them with the means, with the opportunities, and to support them. Tragedy can't be the end of our lives. And we can't allow it to control and defeat us. I don't need to live with a constant aching pain. I don't want to be trapped in the painful moments of my life. I need and will continue with my life, never forgetting the dreams, love, and hopes of my daughters and most important, to bring them justice. I am committed, and this is my mission in life, to bring them justice, and that this tragedy was invested for good. And to prove that life is what we make it, always has been, always will be. It's in our hands to shape the life the way we want. I succeeded in my life. From Jabalia camp, with all kinds of suffering, as a child, I never tasted my childhood. Abject poverty, and sometimes you ask yourself, what brought me to this world? Why am I here? What did I do to this world to suffer? And my parents, who were refugees, they were forced to leave their homes. And when we speak about a refugee, refuge it means you become naked in this world. Of your dignity, of your life. <clears throat> but they didn't lose hope. And they said the only way is education. 
also education, I have to go to school to get rid of the misery of life, not for the sake of education, but to enable me to get a better job, to help my family, because it's a matter of survival. I have to work hard, day and night. I don't know the meaning of a weekend or a summer holiday. I have to find any kind of work. And I dreamed I wanted to be a medical doctor because I was sick as a child and I saw the doctors and I will have a good job to help my family. I am the eldest and then our culture as a person, once you are the eldest, you carry the responsibility. I got a scholarship to study medicine in Cairo. And when I graduated, I was the first among the foreign students. I went back to Gaza. And my, my mother, in particular, was happy to be the mother of the doctor. To be proud of me as I am proud of her. I applied for a job. But that's the issue of injustice in this world. Not to recruit according to your success, according how much do you have, who is your father, an official, senior official, a businessman, or a perpetrator with the Israeli occupation. Thanks God. Proudly, I say it, thanks God, I don't have any of that. I have my credentials, my success. But always, I count on God. God is watching. And I believed in every bad thing we see, there is something good. We may see it as bad. But God is preparing something good for us because God knows and we don't know. I worked in Saudi Arabia. I did my specialty in obstetrics and gynecology and came back to be the first Palestinian working in Israel to go to London, to Harvard. I succeeded, but I will never forget from where did I come that there are millions of Palestinians and non-Palestinians waiting for us to give hand to them, to rescue them. And that's what we need to zoom in, to put ourselves for a second in the position of others. If they were in need, and if we were in need, what do we expect from others? That's why when you succeed, when you reach the shore peacefully, don't forget the millions who are in the middle of the sea or the ocean. And life taught me that nothing is impossible in life. Because everything I planned, I succeeded to achieve. From nothing, the only impossible thing I believe in is to return my daughters back. Even though we are now in the 21st century, it seems a humankind has not learned the lessons. We still have nations, countries, dominating, oppressing, and occupying other nations and countries. We still have parties, factions, media, groups who want to control how people think and how they live. That's why we still have war and conflict around the globe. And the, war, the world is endemic with violence, hatred, injustice, incitement, poverty, and fear. This violence is filling every corner of our world, in homes and in streets. We live in a world which is endemic and conflict 
arises when we violate someone's honor and dignity and destroy both their self-esteem and self-respect. These socioeconomic diseases that we suffer from, they cross barriers and borders. And no one is far from risk. And we all are impacted, either directly or indirectly. <coughs> Structural violence, which is endemic in our world, is caused by a variety of external factors that are rarely in the control of the individuals involved in the conflict, and they pay the price of it. How much of the suffering do we know about in our world? How much of war do we know and see through the media? Is it the soldier who is killed or wounded, or the innocent child, daughter, mother, or old? or children and mothers who are dying in silence because of hunger and lack of access to medical care in Africa and Asia, everywhere. War is about our children, our grandchildren dying before they are fully adults, or being disfigured, wounded, or mentally scarred for life. We hear and see just the numbers. It's time to look at people as people, not numbers. People are people and equal to be judged not by political interest, and we should not be part of it, but be part of exposing it. It's about hundreds of thousands of human beings dying years before their time. It's millions of people separated forever from the ones they loved. No one knows the loss until it happens. As Mahmoud Darwish, the Palestinian poet, said, how simple is the war when we see it with the glasses. He said, he who looks at the sea doesn't know the sea. He who sits on the shore doesn't know the sea. Only he who immerses himself, dives, takes a risk, and forgets the sea in the sea. No one knows freedom until they have lost it. War has much larger cost to a society, in particular to women and the children. We need to fight against this disease and the leading risk factors causing the human suffering. We need to take things to the hearts and pursue the ethics of integrity. We need to protect people in this world who are our human fellows. War is a genocide. War is torture. It's a propaganda. Dishonesty and the slavery of humanity. There is no a term called there is a just war. War and injustice is not just to be documented, but to be prevented as we prevent diseases. Diseases are not to be managed, but to be prevented. War is a defeat and failure to overcome arrogance, ignorance, fear, and the bloodshed. There is no humanitarian holy war. Only peace is sacred and humanitarian. When war ends, all will celebrate the victory. But there is no victory in a war. All are losers. A victory is never built at the expense of innocent human beings, which produces orphans, destruction, and wound the souls that don't heal. Eisenhower said, Every gun that is made, every rocket that is fired, signifies, in the final sense, a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and not clothed. This world is not spending money alone. It's spending the sweat of the laborers, the genius of the scientists, 
and the hopes of the children. This is not a way of life at all. In any true sense, under the cloud of a threatening war, it's a humanity handing, hanging from a cross of iron. A nation, and that's the message to some leaders in this world, to learn from Eisenhower and to follow his values. A nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on the programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. In order to overcome our world problems, this needs honesty and the truth. And the truth goes side by side with the responsibility. It's the responsibility of all to speak the truth and expose the lies. Jesus said in Gospel of John, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Every day, each of us adds a small portion by watching it, <coughs> thinking it's not important, and saying, what can we do? What makes the evil to flourish in this world are good people who do nothing. But what is the best way to get rid of the suffering of the world? Our enemies is not our human fellows. Our enemies are our ignorance of ourselves and others, our arrogance, our fear and the greed. And no one can be ignorant and the free. When we speak about freedom and peace, because which are a blessing and the gift that we need to live and to spread in our world. For any human being, freedom is essential, crucial to our dignity and our ability to be fully human. Peace is not just a word. Peace is not just the absence of war or conflict. Peace is an action, it's a way of life, to believe in it and work for it. And the more we sweat for peace, the less we bleed in war. And we are not as different as we think or the media describes us. In fact, we are all very similar. We might differ in matters of ideologies, religions, opinions, but at the end, we are equal. And we were created from Adam and Eve and became nations and the tribes. For what? To know each other. And knowing is not just to know the name or face. Knowing is to show passion, respect, and to bring people together. And the freedom is important. We all were born free. And we need to live as a free people. And any free person would refuse to die in silence. There is no peace without respecting the human rights. So it's a matter of action. It's not about talking to the patient. When I meet a patient, the patient doesn't need words. He needs a prescription, a medication to be cured. So it's a matter of action. And Martin Luther King said, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. In the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. Willingness and the dreaming or hopes are not enough. We must act, do something to save lives and to speak out. You have many things to give from your knowledge, from your education, from your time. Cultivating a deep trust in ourselves is the beginning of making a difference. Not to continue turning a deaf ears or a blind eyes to speak out and not to delay. To look around, to ask, to learn, to connect with others and then to act. Action is needed if we want to survive connected as brothers, 
cousins and neighbors. It's not to hide behind the fear instead of facing the reality. Because in this world, we all are potential victims. We all are potential victims to the suffering in this world. So we need to fight for the rights, for the truth, for the freedom and justice. Fear and incitement is used as a weapon and exploited to advance the interest of an entity or a group agenda or political agenda. That's what is happening. We need also to be people of values, vision and leadership. You can establish your own values. Values provide the basis for human rights, health and peace and define who you are. Values include the respect for human dignity and social justice. You all have these values. And what you need is to practice and to promote these values and live your life by these values with passion, courage, and persistence. If you can't say the right word, don't applaud the wrong one. We must show life, we must show that life is precious and that none is ignored or considered unworthy of a secure and prosperous life and realize we all face risks. We can't ask people in this world to coexist or accept injustice by having one side to bow their heads and rely on a solution that is just and good for one side. That is injustice. Injustice, of course, leads to violence, and violence begets violence and hatred. I wrote my book, I Shall Not Hate, because the people after what I faced, in particular after the tragedy of my daughters, I will be drowning in hatred. But is it the right way to bring my daughters justice? I have to be strong. I have to be healthy physically, mentally, spiritually, and it's not with hatred. Hatred, for me, it's a poison, it's a fire, it's a disease which kills and weakens the one who is impacted with it and the surrounding. Don't let hatred approach you. Build a shield around you in order to challenge the perpetrator who did harm to you. And don't accept to be a victim more than once. If someone did harm to you, you are a victim of that act. So instead of staying as a victim, be a survival, be a leader. If you were impacted with hatred, you are another victim of hatred. You victimize yourself with this destructive disease. And my definition of hatred is a chronic, self-destructive contagious disease as a result of exposure. So we need to overcome this hatred. And if you face any challenge in life, not to collapse. You need to keep moving, moving forward. And I'm sure you watch soccer games. In any soccer game, if a team to score a goal in the first minute, does this mean or guarantee the success or that team to win the game? We have 98 minutes. Let us wait. Maybe this goal to energize, to provoke the team to work harder and to score not one or two, four or five goals. So let us wait to the last minute and see who is going to smile, who is going to win and to move forward. And the great Lebanese poet Khalil Gibran once said, tenderness and kindness are not signs of weakness and despair, as some people they think in this world, but they are manifestations of strength and resolution. Some may see tolerance, resilience as weakness, and silence as a defeat. But they don't know that resilience and tolerance need a greater power 
than that needed for revenge, and that silence is more powerful than words. Don't underestimate or reject yourself. The first step in failure is to lose confidence, and you can be the one you want to be. And my daughter, Bisan, at the age of 14, she said to me, everything starts small, then becomes big. Everything starts in one place, then it goes in different directions. So start by a small act. In one location, this act can spread in this world. And I learned from my children. So I encourage you to learn from your students. They are smart. Your children, the young generation, we need to listen, to communicate with them. They are smart. And my daughter, Shada, where her life inspired me and not to blame others. The easiest way in this world to blame and to escape responsibility. So instead of blaming, focus your energy to take action and to move forward. Her journey inspired and drived me. She refused to be a victim. And education was her way out. Shada was severely wounded with her sisters and all of my daughters that I'm proud of, those who were killed and those who are living. Their teachers were fighting to have them in their classes. They never succeeded less than 97% in their schools. Shada, during the war, was studying day and night on candles to be one of the top 10 in Palestine, in high school. And what she faced in four months, mountains come to late. 16th of September, 2008, she lost her mother of acute leukemia. Then 16th of January, 2009, three sisters and niece were killed and she was severely wounded. She was treated at the hospital I am working at with the bandages over her eye and two fingers were semi-amputated, just attached with the skin tag. She said, I have to continue. I have to study. And she said to me, if I can't see with my right eye, I have my left. If I can't write with my right hand, bring me papers and pencils to practice with my left hand. I have to continue to achieve the hopes of my sisters. She spent four months at the hospital and then she was discharged she said, I have to go to do the high school exam. I said, what are you talking about? She was discharged in May. And the high school exam in Palestine, it's a national exam for the whole country at the same time from the whole curriculum. I said, what are you doing? She said, no, I have to do it. She did the exam and I didn't expect much from Shada. And when they announced the result in the radio, and she was worried as her friends who didn't suffer any of what did she face, 90, 89, 91, then it came to Shada's name that she succeeded as nothing happened to her. 96 percent. 16th of June 2015, she graduated from the School of Engineering at the University of Toronto. And that's the message, the antidote to hate and revenge <coughs> is to learn from our children. And that the antidote of hate and revenge is education and not to lose the focus and determination. In my life, I am in debt to my mother 
my wife and my daughters. Without their support, I will never achieve or be the one who is standing here. That's why in their memory, I established Daughters for Life Foundation for education of girls and young women. And I am proud and blessed and happy to see Professor James Jones from Manhattanville College who came with two of Daughters for Life scholars who are with us and they are my daughters. We are proud of them that their GPA is four and above and Warda, she is graduating. She graduated in three years and a half. So she graduated this month and of course, Ala, she is planning to study medicine and that's the kind I see in them. My daughters, Bisan, Mayar, Aya and Noor and hope to see scholars also from Daughters for Life at, at the Yale Divinity College. And that's, believe me, that's the human education, the education which has social, a human, peaceful impact in the world. And we need to spread this message. I am here to say there is hope and that nothing is impossible. With hope, there are unlimited possibilities. Tomorrow is hopeful. And I see the hope in our scholars and the students. And I hear, of course, all of the time, the voice of my daughters. <laughs> when I started to think, what can I do to prove to people that I didn't forget my daughters? Hearing the voices of Bisan, Mayar, Aya, and Noor, don't we us achieve our dreams? Continue the journey we started. I can't say and will never say that they are dead. They are just far away from me. I see them, I talk to them. They lift it quickly with a, with a cheery smile. They lift it quickly like lightning. Didn't say a word farewell. Death is not the end and can never be the end. Death is the road and we are the travelers. We passed on and our names are eternal and will be kept eternal. I say to them, rest in peace. You are alive and will be kept alive. Their names will be written in the minds, in the hearts, in souls of people in this world. And the strongest members in any society and my society are women. The women are the authors of the survival story of any nation on earth. Education is a mean to achieve our human goals. Education, health, freedom, peace, and justice depend on who you are and where you are. Education and peace must be translated into bread, rice, shelter, health, justice. Education which helps to smash and destroy the mental and physical barriers within each of us and between us. Education which builds a new generation who believes that advancing a human civilization is a joint project and that the most holy thing in the universe are humans and the freedom. It's time. In a world of despair and loss of hope. But women have maintained the hope. That's why I am optimistic and will keep hopeful about our future because I know when we all come together as men and women, elders and the children for the collective good for all people and advancement of our communities and societies. The whole world will benefit. Women are the balance of our world. Women are the reason the world has made it this far. And women are the only hope 
this world has to rise up and reach its greatness. All humans are capable of achieving, not just imagining. Women who give life, women who nurture life, it's time to say, instead of saying behind the successful man there is a successful woman, we need to say parallel or side by side or behind a successful woman, there is a successful man. No peace, democracy, or respect for human rights without women, and no peace without respect of human rights. Establishing a safe and secure, just and peaceful world is the function of women's education and role in life. One can do everything, but each of us can do something. Helen Keller said, I am only one, but still I am one. I can do everything, but still I can do something. And just because I can do everything, I will not refuse to do something that I can do. Let us, as I said, all come together, men and women, and all to make the world the one we want, free, safe, secure, one for us and the future generations. <coughs> I came here because I believe in the students. I believe the academic institutions, they can spread, and we need a reform in spreading our message. I believe with all of my heart that we all can make a difference. I believe in each of you. I have hope and faith in you. We all need to take action. As I said, I came because I believe in you. Let us hope and act to make the 21st century the century of humanity and women's education and role. Let us hope and work together to foster the theme of Rev. Bartlett and achieve human rights, freedom, and the world's peace. Thank you, and God bless you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Most people who give endowed lectures use their words from this podium to give weight to their life, but your life has given great weight to your words, and we're all <coughs> appreciative. Uh, Professor Abu Laish has agreed to take questions, so if you would raise your hand, please identify yourself and ask your questions succinctly, if you would. We'll try to get a few questions in. We do have refreshments. Uh, for you, and we'll go there in just a few minutes, and we can continue the conversation with the reception. But we want to give you a chance to ask some questions if you would like. Can you stand and just okay, sure. identify um, yourself, please? Dr. Abulaj, thank you. Um, my name is Ruth Alcabez. Um, I appreciate, first of all, I want to give you my condolences on your losses. But um, you said that you know, life is, you know, keep on moving forward and that almost nothing or almost nothing is impossible. Um, and you directed most of your remarks to things that people in the circumstances of people in this room might be able to do. But what kind of advice, I actually ha have some friends in Gaza, some young people, and what kind of advice would you give to a person in the circumstances which seem extremely constrained, which seem that even if, they are educated, there are very few employment opportunities. Um, and, and where they, you know, mobility is limited. So what kind of advice would you give to someone in those kinds of circumstances? Of course, the advice should be to these people and to those who are watching them and who are making them suffering because they are not living in isolation from the environment. 
So we need to change the environment, the context in which these people to live, and they have a responsibility, of course, to challenge the situation in order to move forward. Mm -hmm. But we can't ask a patient, recover by yourself. We need the patient to see the medical doctor, to know the diagnosis, and to, to prescribe the medication. It's not going to help just to put all the efforts oh, on the patient. Okay. So I say to people, take responsibility as much as they can, not to be broken or to be defeated, but we can't keep them to say to the patient, a woman in labor, I will ask you, a woman in labor, if I come as a gynecologist and some woman who experienced delivery, if I come to a woman in labor and to say to her, please keep patient, with the agony of labor pain, what is she going to say to me? <laughs> I've been in that situation. What is she going to say to me, a woman in labor? I ask you, please, what is she going to say? Keep patient, you know, oh, I, let us wait. I was in that situation three times. Um, screaming. So what, are you going, what did you say with the doctor if he said it to you? Um, I couldn't be patient. I wasn't patient. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what is needed. It's the responsibility of the stronger, the doctor, to take care and to help the people there. And of course, then the woman in labor, she will be cooperative with the doctor. Thank you. Right next to her, please. Can you stand and identify yourself? Yeah, please? hello. Uh, my name is Polly. Thank you so much for your story. Really, thank you so much. Um, you spoke a little bit about the importance of spiritual health, and you've been through so much, so I was wondering if you had any um, advice for how to keep spiritual health. And you also discussed structural violence. Um, as people who exist in the West and in um, organizations of structural violence, I was wondering what recommendations of actions we could take um, in, these, in these scenarios. As I said, the spirituality is important. I am a person of faith. I have good relations with God. I count on God. And God does not want anything from us. God wants every good thing for us. So I am in reconciliation with God. I know when I make a mistake, I am not angel, I am not a saint, I make mistakes, but I know it. So I believe that everything from God is for God, and he knows, and we don't know. This is one thing. The second, God is there to help us. The more we approach God, God will approach us faster. So that's what I believe, and that's my faith taught me to practice it. I feel God is observing and watching us. So this is important. That's the spiritual issue and uh, in, part in my life. And some people, they think, you know, because my heart is my compass. It directs me. If I feel it, I go with it. So thanks, God, I am still with myself and watched by God, and I keep it. And they treat people as people, as a human fellows, I don't ask about the religion, because by the end, the religion is not for me. It's between the individual and God. And I'm not here to judge people about their faith or their religion. The problem in this world with people who think they are God and they are judging others, criticizing others. I can judge someone how he treats me. How he deals with me, that's what I can. But if he prays, if he, this is his own issue. It's not for me. Concerning the structural violence, you know, it's an agenda. So we need the one who knows to tell the one who doesn't and to expose it and to take actions, Organiza join organizations to expose it, to say political leaders to choose the right, the good political leaders who are there to take risk, not to manipulate their positions, who are ready to sacrifice their positions for the sake of justice, human rights, and freedom. 
and to expose these lies. So it's our responsibility because these political leaders who are using structural violence, they are not coming from the sky. <coughs> they didn't come with parachute. Who are they? Who are they? Politicians and leaders in this world. And uh, of course, the, where is the wealth located? You know, where is the wealth located? The giants of the wealth, where 50% of the wealth is located in the hands of 60 people. And 85% is located in 15%. And the other 85 poor people, they are getting poor and poor. So this means they suck the money and the resources of the poor. And by the end, they have to understand when they die, are they going to take this money with them? No one is going to take anything with him. We want to leave a good legacy to be remembered as good people. How can we tolerate? Because sometimes the people, they lost the feeling in their heart. They are not connected with their heart. Only they think, how much can I suck money? Or they think the money gives, it will never give them happiness or satisfaction. Because happiness, you can have happiness by sharing with others. The more you share, you will be the happier. So these people, they are not happy at all. They have the money, but it will never. You can't buy happiness. They are enjoying it, but joyful moments, they are transient. So we need, it's our responsibility, all of us, to work together, organizations, what we call it, the, inter the international community, the United Nations, which is not United Nations. It's United Governments. Doesn't represent the nations there. We have no voice as people in this world there. It's some leaders were elected and they have to decide what do they want for more than seven billion people in this world. So it's our responsibility, these people who are there, to show them that the chairs where they are sitting, they are shaking. They are not stable, they are not there to be, and those leaders to understand that they are not going to be eternal. They have to leave one day. One more question and then we'll call it quits. Yes, sir. Um, my name is Jimmy Jones. I'm an alum of YDS, by the way. Um, you're a moral exemplar for me. Um, uh, what advice would you give to people who are studying, many, many people here are studying to be clergy, um, and it, I can tell from listening to you that you read a lot. Uh, what, what are you reading? What, what do you recommend that people read in, in terms of thinking about the kind of life that you think we should try to be exemplify? Uh, thank you, Professor Jones, of course. He is professor at Manhattanville College. I know him more than 25 years when I came to Manhattanville and met him. And since then, he helped us in building the partnership between Daughters for Life and Manhattanville College. And now we have four scholars. Three will graduate this year from Manhattanville College. So I read personally, when I was at the school, in Gaza, my mother forced me, can say forced me, I have to register in school after this, the ordinary school to learn Quran. And for what? In order to run for competition and I can get some money, a reward. I went there, I, I have to work and I was blessed and thanks God for everything he gave me and everything he took. I did well and I got many awards at that time. And the interesting thing, I remember when I went to get it from the governor of the Gaza Strip, because Gaza Strip was under the Egyptian administration. And the governor is coming 
And a 10 years old a child really going to the ceremony barefooted. And when I went, of course, they called me to get the gift, the, bra the award, financial award. They called me. And I went, of course, the first thing, I want the money. Because we are in need of it. I don't know these protocols that you have to shake and then. So I learned, Quran helped me a lot <laughs> to read and to succeed. So I like to know about other nations. And also, one of the books I read about all of the prophets. All of the prophets, I read about them. I am more spiritual. That's why I like humanitarian issues to learn about it. And even these days, most of my interest and research are focused not about medicine. It's about well-being and other human values, resilience, tolerance, forgiveness, uh, hatred. These issues which are endemic in our world as I said, these socio-economic diseases, and it needs a sense of humanity to feel your heart. I believe, as I said, the heart is the entrance to our minds. You need to touch the hearts in order to trigger a change in the mind. So you need first to enter the hearts of the people and to explain to them you have an important organ in your body. It's not bumping blood. It has another function. To feel, to connect with others. Would you join me in thanking Professor Alvin? Thank you. Thank you so much.